Hello everyone and a warm welcome to one of this afternoon's concurrent sessions, The Art of Sporting Heritage. My name's Imogen Gibbon, I'm Deputy Director and Chief Curator of Portraiture at the National Galleries of Scotland and I'm also a trustee for the Hockey Museum. With just under a thousand sporting related artworks in the collection of the National Galleries of Scotland, we're proud to be a member of Sporting Heritage and I'm absolutely over the moon to be chairing this session today on one of my favourite subjects. So we have two presentations for you this afternoon. My colleague, Robin Bailey, Senior Outreach Officer at the National Galleries of Scotland, will be talking about the Spartans, football action portraits, the National Galleries of Scotland learning and engagement project with young people's people at the Spartans Alternative School, part of the Spartans Community Football Academy in North Edinburgh, and Rosie Milne, Community Learning Officer at Wimbledon Lawn Tennis Museum, will be presenting Opening Up Wimbledon Through Art, which focuses on a community art project inspired by the new retractable roof on Number One Court, working with Hearts and Minds, a peer-led charity and service for young people experiencing mental health difficulties. I just wanted to say a big thanks from myself, Robin and Rosie, to colleagues at Sporting Heritage for creating such a vibrant, varied, member-supporting and network-inspiring digital conference and also for setting up the three of us to share this session as part of the two day programme. We're going to run the two presentations one after the other, followed by a short panel discussion, and then we'll move on to the, the questions, questions from delegates. Some of you may have submitted questions in advance, but please do as the session goes on, um, pop your question, comments, or ideas, anything else in the chat feed during the session. So before we join our presenters, here's an introduction to Robin and Rosie. Robin Bailey has managed the National Galleries of Scotland Learning and Engagement Outreach Programme since 2001. He's curated several major exhibitions based on this programme, including the forthcoming Image Liberation Force from the Ruins, which will open at the Scottish National Portrait Gallery in April next year and sees young employed Scots reinvent Scottish history via the National Galleries of Scotland art collect, Scottish Art Collection. He's a keen footballer and has um, used NGS sporting related artworks for several projects to break down the barriers between art and sport. Rosie Milne is the Community Learning Officer at Wimbledon Lawn Tennis Museum, a post she's held for the last three years, having previously worked for the National Trust for Scotland. Wimbledon Lawn Tennis Museum creates opportunities for people living in Merton and Wandsworth to engage with Wimbledon when the championships are not on, so not an inconsiderable 50 weeks of the year, in ways other than tennis through arts projects, talks and workshops, tours of the Wimbledon grounds and outreach sessions. And Rosie's responsible for um, developing this year round programme. So to our first presentation, I'm now gonna share my screen with Robin's presentation. And many thanks to Robin for letting me gate crash the first minute of his presentation, just to give you a little bit of context about the project you're going to hear about. Um, at the National Galleries of Scotland, we recognise the potential for our sporting artworks to connect with audiences. This goes back to 1962, when the Scottish National Portrait Gallery's major summer exhibition that year was Sport in Scotland. Since then, we've put on several sports related exhibitions, commissioned and acquired portraits of Scottish sports stars and consolidated our collection, particularly with photographic works of grassroots sporting activity, whilst also using these works to engage with a variety of audiences through memory and reminiscence projects, community art projects, catalog cataloging projects and family activities which even included a live curling indoor curling session in the great hall of the scottish national portrait gallery and for that activity we partnered with the national governing body um, scottish curling so these two portraits were used by robin as part of a set of national galleries of scotland sporting artworks shown to participants in the spartans projects we have dave Mackay on the left kenny dalgleish on the right they were commissioned by the National Galleries of Scotland in 2003 as part of Scotland's Dream Team, a series of 11 portraits of Scottish footballers and one of their manager, Jock Steen, all by the artist Mark Ianson. And the Dream Team was chosen by Mark himself, 
who use press photos and other archive material to create these large scale, many of them are just, um, just about two meters tall portraits. Moving on to another example of one of the NGS works that Robin used um, at the very beginning of his engagement with the Spartans participants. This is a film work, it's called Zidane, the 21st century portrait. It's by the Scottish artist Douglas Gordon and the French artist Philippe Pareno. It's a 90 minute film, filmed in real time with 17 cameras trained solely on Zidane following him during La Liga match between Real Madrid and Villarreal on the 23rd of April 2005. And during the last minute of the match, the film actually captures Zidane being sent off for his part in a brawl. So with community projects such as the Spartans football portraits, we're seeking to bring the engagement experiences we develop in relation to the collection back into the gallery setting as exhibitions harnessing these elements of physical activity and interaction to further activate the collection. And Robin, now handing over to you. Thank you very much, Imogen, and thanks for your support consistently over the years, sorry, for these kind of projects. So the young people were actually fascinated and animated about Zidane, Douglas Gordon's inside his head, heavy breathing portrait video, and especially this Galactico's violent fall from grace, both in the video and in his headbutt in the World Cup final. In this way, without institutional respect, but sourced on their own experience, they entered every heritage image shown to them in their own way, as they should. We know what we are paid to think, but what do they think? I'm going to describe the aim of the project, show a film which outlines what happened on it, and then raise some issues and possibilities that arise from the experience. So the four young women and 10 young men who were 15 to 17 year olds we worked with are developing their learning supported closely by staff in an environment designed to equip them to overcome the severe challenges they face. We offered them a creative visual art experience that would develop their resilience and emotional well-being. This project was the follow-up to an earlier successful collaboration that had opened up their emotional expressivity via making clay heads and raw sash blot abstract paintings. An alternative school is the perfect partner for the NGS outreach team, as we're determined to do things differently to bridge the gap between the gallery, the collection, and the realities encountered by the young people we work with. We try to make our works of art relevant to the issues that affect their lives. We avoid putting the art on a pedestal. We want it to be used, enjoyed, scraped, bent, decried, laughed at, and repurposed by its viewers. For those young people for whom society has offered little in terms of opportunity, we offer our art without any unearned status. Instead, we put it in the mixer. I suppose the point is that everybody should own sport and art. We sought to break down a huge social and cultural divide by making sport and art, feelings and actions one. Imogen's now going to play the film, give you a flavour of the project. It's a National Gallery's Scotland outreach project with the young people down at the Spartans Alternative School in North Edinburgh. Nice. We didn't really want to send it to camera. Nice. We didn't want to speak on it. Nice. You'll see their actions. And in a way, that let them speak. So I think, hopefully, that's the point. That there's lots of different ways of expressing yourself. And how the... full-size portrait figures. They made a team, and hopefully that team included them all. It's a school that uses football to let off steam, and that's the context for its teaching, its alternative teaching. It's individual care and attention for the young folk who are there. The portraits, portraits of Ken Dalgleish, who they just about knew, but we're talking about character. We're saying, like, you know, what does it take to, for people to perform and, you know, continually put themselves on the line in games and match up to other people's expectations? How do folk protect themselves against that? We talked about Lee Griffiths and Neil Lennon being open about having mental health issues. That Argentina game where it was just, you know, heart wrenching for them and all the rest of us. Things that people do 
they're not just role models all the time and they know that well, unacceptable stuff, you know. The artists we worked with were Sarah Jane Henderson, who was brilliant working one-to-one -one each week, individuals two at a time, quiet, getting to know people, developing their interests. So it doesn't matter if it's art. They don't care. I don't care. Sarah Jane doesn't care. Do you think this even looks nice anymore? I do. I think it looks brilliant. Alex Callaghan, who's the football um, freestyler, he didn't care either, as long as they were able to be themselves out there in this sort of game of life and that they could feel confident that that was something they were quite happy to put outside themselves, to put back on the pitch. Totally honest and totally spontaneous. And we've got brilliant art, we've got brilliant people, and we've got a brilliant experience. So the premise was action, not talk. So let's do it on the field. Actually, there was plenty of chat, raucous banter, including unacceptable personal abuse concerning other students' sexual identity. With the whole group, that was this was divisive and it was difficult to manage at the start. Even so, this was real, and it was part of the discussion about what they thought it takes to succeed in football and other sports. We discussed self-expression, fairness, team spirit, losing, being dropped, injuries, abuse, and what character and identity really is. There was partiality and bias about certain teams, certain sports, and the language of equalities. But these were their opinions, and they had to be aired for the young people to work on them. They have to enter, ask themselves. As the film has shown, the young people under, understood how, even though they hadn't suggested the avatar idea, and to some extent, I wrongly imposed it on them because in youth work principles, you're advised that the young people have to initiate the idea themselves. But still, they really enjoyed letting loose with all their power and force to make these images. They made marks, explosions, rhythms, patterns, and accepted accidents and all this on a tunnel in a psychopath, sorry, in a tunnel on a local psychopath, whilst kindly stopping to let cyclists, joggers, and dog, waters, dog walkers pass by unpainted. We did this in small groups of two and three to maintain a level of controlled expression, I was gonna say aggression, controlled expression. Even so, one guy often tried to boot the ball at any girl in the same group. We tried to stop, and condemn this aggression every time. And we saw how the girls had to cope with this brutal request for attention, stroke affection. Any working class woman, any woman knows this aggression. They assumed gendered and natural monopoly on force and unwanted contact. And here it was as play or banter. But we all, including Sarah Jane, the artist, wanted to help this lad to show his need differently from how he had learned to do it so far. Sarah's own role as a mother of a son who had got into trouble lent her an insight we did not have. This brought out the confidences that the young people shared with her in the one-to-one -one workshops that she did with each participant. The slide that you should be looking at is Alex, the community learning student, youth worker and football freestyler, there he is, whose presentation to the students, his tricks and the video art he made from them which he put online, provided the initial idea for the project. I applied it to the mannequin figures and the idea of building a team to represent each person. Alex, when he was presenting to the group, had also been explicit about his own experience of going off the rails and using his passion for football and creativity to build a stable future. So each figure has a backstory of passions, ambitions, hopes and fears, conveyed just like the greatest abstract paintings, through gestural strokes, vivid exploding colors and bold optical patterns. They carry their marks like scars, trophies, like tattoos. They're proud and personal, honest and authentic, vulnerable and brave. The guy who said he put the barbed wire around the figure because that's all the bad things that he'd been through and survived. Well, that was the best post-match interview we could have got, raw, but thoughtful and brave to say it in public. And it evidences the usefulness of these portrait figures to externalize and carry the emotional experience of the individual young people 
out into the world. They might never otherwise verbalize these experiences or share them. Not all were as focused as this portrait, but each little mark and touch left a bit of their maker's character on the figure. And even now in gallery education, we don't ever take the participant, the creator, artwork seriously enough. Even at the National Galleries of Scotland, where we've presented major exhibitions of young people's work over the years, we still don't take these works into the collections or even the films that document the projects. And I have to say, they're usually made by professionals, unlike the one you've just watched. But if you look closely at this portrait, no professional artist could have made something more complex, more lucid, more shocking, dramatic, more worthy of serious consideration. It shows one young person's vision of their journey into a fragile future. I mean, think of the social benefits if institutions shared our precious, valuable work of art status more evenly. So finally, the game's a great leveler and there you are to my shame, it's proved. I'm trying to do keep you up ahead us with the team. Look at the concentration, the poise, the alertness, the patheticness. Sarah Jane said that the games at the end with all the figures on the pitch were the best bit. And I think all the young folk would have agreed. Where there was no difference between the wooden portraits, the lasses and the lads, the true vanityless artists, i.e. them, and us, the adults, the paid artists, the professionals. We're all playing together at the end, like a street, like a gang, a family, a class, a multiple one. So these real players have created their own unique sporting and artistic heritage without asking for anything back. And the National Galleries of Scotland cherishes them and their contributions. Thanks very much. Thanks, Robin. Rosie, over to you. Thanks, Imogen. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here uh, virtually. Um, thank you to Joe for coordinate, coordinating the session behind the scenes. Um, I'm going to share my screen as well. So I'm going to be sharing um, a community arts project that we um, completed last year in 2019. Um, and so I'll give you a bit of a background to the community arts projects that we do um, before focusing in on our project itself, looking at who we partnered up with, um, how the project developed, and then reflecting on the challenges and successes. So our community arts project started back in 2011 as a way of further serving our communities of Merton and Wandsworth, which the museum borders. And these are the two local boroughs based in southwest London. And it's very common perception for our locals to think that Wimbledon only exists for two weeks of the year because that's when the circus rolls into town and that's when all the hype is and the tennis comes along. Um, but we actually have a thriving programme year round, which is lesser well known at Wimbledon. And so for us, the Community Arts Project is such a fantastic way to open up Wimbledon to people who wouldn't otherwise visit because they might perceive it to be too elitist or upper class um, and really um, allow people to explore the collection in creative ways and just explore it in ways other than tennis. So Every single arts project that we do is completely different um, year on year, but there are some key elements that will remain the same. Um, so first and foremost, every project puts people at the heart um, and at the center. So we don't care what the art turns out like, we don't care what it looks like. We want people to be able to express themselves, to develop new skills, grow in confidence, and just have the freedom to, to get involved with the resources that we have on offer. Um, in terms of budget, um, we have a budget of £12,000 to do this community arts project, which for me coming from the charity sector nearly had to have a lie down over when I was first told. Um, but this budget is um, funded by the Wimbledon Foundation, which is the charitable arm of the All England Lawn Tennis Club. And I would say that a lot of the money does go on flashy photography and um, videos as well, so you can definitely um, do projects like these for a lot cheaper. 
Um, and then in terms of time scale, um, we are always working towards the next championships at Wimbledon. So we have to have it finished by about May, June. Um, and so we'll typically run it for about six months from January to June. And I will start planning behind the scenes around November, December time. So having a look now to the focus of last year's project, um, it was under one roof and it was inspired by the new retractable roof that was going on number one court that year. And as you can see in the image, um, there's these giant beams, these trusses that span the width of number one court. And each of these beams, <coughs> excuse me, losing my voice, each of these beams um, weigh a whopping 100 tonnes. And I watched as they were hoisted up on Europe's largest crane um, last year onto number one court roof. And 100 tonnes is equivalent to um, an adult blue whale. So there's about 11 blue whales worth of weight hanging in this roof. And they, they are the key supporting structures that enable the roof to open and close and to function. So taking this theme of support, I thought it would be interesting to explore themes of support in the community and to have a look at what support networks exist in our local communities of Merton and Wandsworth. And that formed the basis for this project. So with this theme, we were able to shape who our community partners would be. And we partnered up with a group called Hearts and Minds, who are a peer-led um, support group for young people suffering from mental health difficulties. And they meet up um, down in Wimbledon um, on a weekly basis. And I had met them before and um, was following them on Twitter and Instagram and saw how creative they were. Um, they were really, really creative bunch doing loads of arts-based projects, which they always showed off online. So I knew that they were going to be a team that were, were up for working with, on this project with us. And then in terms of the artists, well, we always work with local artists. Um, previously, they've tended to be professional, um, but with this theme of support, I wanted to support a new and up and coming artist. So I approached Wimbledon College of Arts and they helped me put out an advert. And um, we managed to have an application from a student called Beatrice Morris, who was a production arts for screen student in her second year. And she became the lead artist on the project. Um, so at the inception phase, we, uh, well, I met up individually with these partners and then we all came together because it was really important that we were collaborating from the beginning and we were creating a shared understanding and a shared vision of what we wanted this project to be. So it was an opportunity to learn more about each other, learn about the user needs of the group of Hearts and Minds um, and think about how we wanted to go about this and what the community groups, the group wanted to develop and make. So the artist came up with an idea of using these giant white umbrellas as a blank canvas. And these would sort of symbolize the roof and there would be 11 of them to symbolize each of the 11 trusses on the number one court roof. And Hearts and Minds were um, up for exploring um, what support meant to them on an individual basis, as well as on a group basis as their peer support group, and that they would express what support meant to them by creating these umbrellas. So this was the basis of the project. And we then moved into the sessions. So all of the sessions were held in their own space, down at um, Merton Art Space in Wimbledon. And the first session, it was just the artist and I going along to observe, to get to know the group members, um, that allow them to ask questions and kind of shape the, the project and tailor it appropriately. And then from then we started the art session. So they were led by the artists, kicked off with um, doing mind mapping, collages, drawing, listening to music, thinking of all the ways that we need support in our lives and how that manifests. Um, and as you can see, we had really talented people within the group. So. Some of them just wanted to get uh, stuck into decorating the umbrellas in the very first session. So we just, you know, just go for it. That's entirely up to you, it's great. Uh, others took their time, they're a bit slower with the, the development process. These two individuals with the drawings either side, they would go away and doodle in their spare time and come back and show off their work. So people could approach it in any way they liked and it was entirely up to them what the umbrella then looked like overall. 
Um, so we ran the sessions for about six weeks and in the middle we took a pause and they were able to resume their normal session because we were aware that we were going into their weekly sessions and perhaps <laughs> encroaching on their space. So they resumed their session and then we had a break and they came to Wimbledon. And uh, so here are some of the group members. Um, they also brought along members of their board, um, which was really great. And they enjoyed a lovely tour of the grounds and the sunshine. Um, we let them loose in the learning department and they got their hands on our handling collection um, and of course toured the museum. And then we went back to the art sessions and this is what they ended up producing. So 11 amazing umbrellas, all completely different. We had one that was celebrating LGBTQ plus rights with the umbrella colours. Um, we had another umbrella that was um, the sort of inside thoughts of somebody who was suffering from depression and anxiety. So that was definitely a more emotive umbrella. Um, and then one of the umbrellas was simply a reaction to an album they were listening to during the sessions. They just loved the artwork um, on the album cover and they decided to make an umbrella based on that again because those songs were helping them getting through the daily struggles in life. So totally different umbrellas that, that came out overall. And then to finish off the project, um, I ran a sort of special evening for their friends and family to come along to. And it was the first time that they had seen the umbrellas um, installed in the museum exhibition space. Um, so the exhibition was celebrating the history of number one court and we plonked those umbrellas, as you saw on the slide before, right in the middle, um, which was the first of its kind. And then they had a preview of the, like a first look preview of the, the film that we had made. And it was quite an emotional evening and what made it really special is that Beth, the leader who's in her early 20s and an amazing woman, she told me that she hadn't seen a lot of the friends and family at previous Hearts and Minds group events. And this is often because group members are perhaps ashamed or embarrassed at um, opening up about their mental health. They don't always tell their families where what the group is they just maybe say it's a youth group or something or meeting up with friends but because they had become really involved and invested in this project and were really proud of the results and the fact that it was on show at Wimbledon and that they wanted to bring along um, their friends and family so that made it extra special. Um, Reflecting on the challenges, um, I needed to be sensitive to the, to the nature of the group, of course. We were coming to their sessions on a weekly basis, um, and these sessions were times for them to open up and share their, their struggles and, and, and their challenges in life. Um, so we very much um, were asked to integrate into the group. We were be involved in the check-in and the check-out of every single session. We took part in the activity. So we ourselves were opening up a lot about our mental health um, on a personal basis to make sure that we, we had that mutual respect and understanding. And we all knew it was a safe space and whatever was said in that room stayed in the room. Um, so age, the age range of the participants was anywhere from 14 to 25. So it, for me, it was keeping on top of things like parental consent and permission forms, especially when we were making the film, making sure that the people that had given consent were in the film. It's difficult when you're filming a big room of people, all of the photography, um, the events such as coming on site, whether they needed a, a parent or guardian. So that was quite tricky to keep on top of and something to be aware of. Um, drop in nature, that's a classic with working with community groups, you might see somebody um, in one session and then maybe never see them again and that's life, things happen, things get in the way and um, so that's absolutely fine. Fortunately, um, members of the group would there'd be maybe two or three working on each umbrella, um, so it was fairly easy to kind of plug any gaps in the sessions or, or work on it with um, those that were there. And then for me on a personal basis, evaluation is always a tricky one. Um, this was my first community arts project that I was leading solo. And uh, it was quite a task to manage the, the project and all the different elements. And um, I found myself doing the thing of running around to the end, trying to collect an evaluation forms. Of course, it's too late because you need to embed evaluation from the beginning, as we know. Um, but fortunately, the video, um, we did a two minute version, which I'm about to show, and then a five minute version, and that captured a lot of the reflections of the group members and their feedback on the project. Um, but that's definitely something I should work on for future projects. And then overall successes. Um, 
collaboration was key, bringing on these community partners, bringing them on together from the outset, made sure that the project was their own and that they were driving the, the outcome of it. Um, I didn't want to be prescribing the project or saying this is what you're going to do. It was important that it was um, co-created from the beginning. Um, longer term engagement, I cannot stress this enough, if you've got the time and the resource, having a long term engagement really deepens your engagement and you can develop way stronger relationships with the group if you're able to work with them over a period of time rather than just going in in one hit sessions or a couple of sessions. Um, I felt like they opened up a lot more and, and as a result that we had much stronger outcomes for the project as a result of working with them over time, getting to know them. Um, and of course, another outcome was they just felt so proud of this project. They were so pleased because it was it was theirs. It was like embodied in what hearts and minds meant to them, what support meant to them. And that really came across through the umbrellas because they were able to just express themselves freely and there was no sort of being held back. Um, legacy wise, um, so the umbrellas, as you saw, were at, formed an art installation in the museum's exhibition. So that was on show for a year and we get around 90,000 visitors to Wimbledon Lawn Tennis Museum. Um, the video was actually also picked up by the commercial team and was played in the queue um, during the championships and on the hill, which is very exciting because um, often um, our work during the championships is, <laughs> you know, it's not not important when, it, when the Wimbledon's on. Um, and it, the umbrellas were also used in future community events at Wimbledon as well. So there was a nice sort of legacy and of course the film was put online and on YouTube which is there for, for permanent viewing. So uh, I'll now finish by playing you a film which encapsulates the, the project overall. I'm the lead artist for an installation going in at the Wimbledon Lawn Tennis Museum. It's all based around the reopening of Number One Court because it just had this beautiful roof built and it's almost fabric-like the way that the roof collapses and reopens. I'm using these 11 umbrellas because it's got these 11 trussets that support this collapsible roof and these 11 umbrellas are our own personal collapsible roofs. Wimbledon introduced me to a community group that they work with called Hearts and Minds. They've been involved with the making of it and it really linked up with the project because it was all based on support. Support of the roof and how these young people support each other. So Hearts and Minds is a community of young people who are between the ages of 14 and 25 uh, who all have experience of mental health problems, emotional distress um, and who I guess all want to come together to provide each other with support, get involved in different activities and I guess generally break that kind of quite isolated cycle that a lot of young people struggling with their mental health can find themselves in. It's an artist coming in with an idea that we never would have probably thought about ourselves, connecting up all these different concepts. As a support group, we get to um, decorate those umbrellas however we decide. I think support is completely and utterly at the heart of hearts and minds, and so I hope that these umbrellas will kind of represent that. These umbrellas have come back with so much personality, um, an unpredictable amount of vibrancy. Um, yeah, it's been fantastic. They've really driven it into a new direction, which has been really great. So thank you very much for listening. I'm aware I've gone slightly over time. Sorry, Imogen. Um, if anybody wants to get in contact with me directly, then I've just popped my email in the corner and feel free to get in contact afterwards as well. So I shall hand back to Imogen now. Oh, I think you're just on mute still, Imogen. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks to both of you, Robin and Rosie. That, that, that was great. I think that was a really good follow on from something that Tim said in one of the earlier sessions. The heritage collection is great, but it's nothing without people. I think that really pushes the point home. So um, Robin, I can see has been answering some questions, but I think he's only been answering them to the panelists. So rather than to delegates as well. So we'll go through all of those just in case the answers have been missed. Um, 
So first question, actually, this is exactly the, the first question I was going to ask you both. Um, I sort of know the answer for one of them, but um, have the umbrellas or will the umbrellas, will the figures be accessioned into um, the collection? Rosie, do you want to go first on that one? That's a great question. If you could ask the collections team to get on that, that would be fab. <laughs> um, I haven't heard of their plans for their plans to be yet, but I definitely support that. And I think that would be a, a really good addition to our collection. So something for me to, to take away. Yeah, I mean, it's the age old problem. I, you know, it, it would be it, by now, they should be being accession to collections. You know, institutions would say, we've got too much stuff already. You know, we can't even support the works that we've got. Half of them are in the basement, da, da, da. Having said that, we're, we are dedicated to equalities and access, and that should fit for collecting as well. And it, it, it you never got, it's always, you know, this participant word, you know, participant, it diminishes people. You know, they're artists as well. Now, I'm not saying it in this hippie sense, but they have put themselves into those things. And when we put that stuff on display, and we would have, the National Galleries were, had lined us up for an exhibition, which was um, sadly um, canceled because of COVID. I don't think it'll happen again, of course, but um, the, the, the figures still wouldn't have been accessioned and none of our films have been accessioned either, you know, as I say. So the sad fact is that unless we demonstrate our commitment to equality, people won't come to us looking to be part of us. Imogen. Thank you. Just had my eye on the um, ch chat uh, area here. Um, another question about the mechanics of the project, both projects. Why didn't you go further afield than the surrounding districts? Um, so our year-round programme, we, we have visitors from all over the country, all nationally, internationally. This particular project um, kind of throws open the doors to people living, living locally because they might seem that we're closed the year round, so we want to try and show that the gates are open. Um, it's often perceived a bit like Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory and that if you've got your golden ticket, you come on in and you can have a great day out. But for a lot of people living in Merton and Wandsworth, if that's um, simply not the case, but maybe because they, they think tennis isn't for them or the tournament isn't, isn't as accessible. So we use this project as a way to as I said, open up the gates to, to people living locally. But of course, our programme does encompass a much broader reach in lots of other ways, whether that's via our schools, colleges, universities, formal education programme or our informal projects. Yeah, I mean, it's a good question because we are in the National Galleries of Scotland. We are meant to be national. We do do national projects. There's one answer, funding. So, but it also goes back to what Rosie said about getting time to work with groups. So I'd worked with that group before that's where you start getting things happening you know if you talk about you know as rosie did depth and quality of experience quality of outcome even if you want to say that even evaluation it's because you've put time in you've been there you've developed a, a relationship now that doesn't mean you can't do that and we we do work in north Ayrshire, we work in the borders we work in the highlands but those big projects we need outside funding for and 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 you know over the last couple of years for one reason or another, we've not had that outside funding to support those big projects. Hopefully that'll change very soon. Um, in the past, we did have that money. We have done full national projects with 16 different partners. So, you know, we do, I'm aware of your question. I think it's also important to nurture the local community. These young folk in North Edinburgh, Muir House, one of the poorest areas in Scotland, if not the second most poorest area, they don't go even go into the centre of Edinburgh, never mind the national galleries. So, you know, it's important to, for us to go to them, even there, even if it's only three miles down the road, do you know what I mean? Imogen, <laughs> back to you. Well, it looks like Imogen is possibly frozen. It's frozen, oh shit, right, here's a question. Can you engage oh, no, with these, back. oh, have I frozen? You know, you, you were coming back there. I think I'm You're coming not. Going, um, but... so this, okay, I'll keep going. 
Um, do you engage with these individuals and groups after the projects are completed? Did, Did you catch that, me, Robin? Uh, do you work with the groups after they're completed, after the projects are completed? Well, yeah, I mean, that's the whole point. I mean, one way of coping with lack of funding and lack of coverage is to maintain the network of all the groups that we've worked with in the past. Now, I say all, maybe some have fallen through the wayside, but by and large, we do keep them on board. We've done projects with North Ayrshire Health and Social Care Partnership for five years now, Borders, four years, you know. We, we we have met, and then if we send out a box, for example, we did an art of the future box, not during COVID, um, two years before we were ahead of our time, um, and we made an exhibition of that, and that went all around Scotland. That was like mail delivery and you know final exhibition in the national galleries. So yeah, we use all these methods um, to try and maintain, you know, because in a way that's maybe the only way they're ever going to experience a relationship with the national gallery. So it's worth it to maintain every relationship if possible. We've tried to build that network to continue to do that. Yeah, I would agree. And I've, I think we're more in, a, in an uh, early stage and perhaps yourselves. Um, so when I, I took up this position three years ago, community learning didn't exist. Um, so it was a new role and a sort of new outreach, as it were, formerly it was mainly schools. And we and the, obviously the community art project was running, but they've really amped up the focus on how we can and um, work um, with people who probably wouldn't, as Robin says, would never ever set through, fit through our, our gates. Um, so we're hoping that this community art project, now that we've kind of formed a, a new look for it and, and this collaborative side, that we'll be able to maintain these relationships going forward. Um, Hearts and Minds as being so close to us have, have been great to see repeatedly. They've come back to Wimbledon and we've seen them at future events. So hoping that we can keep up that relationship that we formed during last year's project. Thanks both of you. Hoping everyone can hear me. W wave if you can't, Robin and Rosie. Right. Um, so another question, great projects, dealing with experimental art and engaging with new audiences. There is a big aspect of the unknown. Did either of you have to persuade your institution to give you permission and backing to go for it? Will I go first, Rosie? Go for it. Uh, no, because we've proved in the past that we can do it successfully. You always want to break new ground, you know, that, and that's why I, you know, hopefully there's enough criticism in that presentation that we still don't let the young people have as much power as is possible. <laughs> why? Well, we don't do it on purpose, but giving away power is just as much a skill as, you know, it's saying it. You know, I mean, saying it is easy, actual enacting it. And, I, and, you know, I said that about the derivation of the idea for the project, that they should have come up with the, the whole thing, not just their bit. So there's still a long way to go. Um, having said that, the National Gallery has supported us over the last 20 years to do outreach. And Rosie makes a good point there. We've been doing outreach for 20 years. We didn't do it before that, but we've been doing now. So we've got a track record and we've been able to do these exhibitions at the end that Rosie was able to do as well. That makes all the difference. Rosie said that about the recognition factor. You know, that's what I was saying about distributing the status. We've got all the status, they've got none. Let's make sure that these projects are a way of turning that around. Yeah, certainly with the museum installation, um, it was the first of its kind in terms of size and scale in that exhibition space. We normally we maybe have a little corner, so it did take a, a fair bit of persuasion, but there was unanimous support for it overall. Because we are part of the wider Wimbledon umbrella, um, if we ever wanted to have something displayed at the championships, then of course that would be a different story. And it would be very difficult, I think, to, to produce something and, be, and stand up in a boardroom and say, we don't know what it's going to look like, because um, I think that would be a, a, an absolute challenge because obviously the championships in Wimbledon have a very, very strong brand, um, which is very important and integral to the heritage of the club, um, with obviously the green and purple stripes being won. So the umbrellas obviously turned out magically. Um, they look, they did look visually stunning, but I didn't plan for that to happen. Um, and it could have, it could have been a um, very different outcome. So I think the museum is embracing it. The more that we can keep pushing and pushing and growing and, and allowing, when you're know, getting colleagues who work in other offices down to the museum and to see the exhibition, um, we hopefully step by step, we can start pushing out into more public spaces within the Wimbledon area. 
Thanks, both of you. Um, now, moving on, what positive benefits did both projects have on those participating, considering how the pandemic has negatively impacted on health and well-being? Um, well, I, I take it Rosie's point about evaluation. You know what I mean? Evaluation does not exist in normal people's um, parlance. You know what I mean? People do things, they experience things, they give themselves or they don't give themselves. You know, the films kind of, you know, make up for that in a way, as Rosie pointed out as well. Um, the positive, well, what can you say, right? So how do you measure the health and well-being? The project we did previous to this one with those very same young people, plus others, was about mental health and well-being, but the, the key to their the improvement, if that's the word, and they would have to say it themselves, was the fact that they did it. They totally lost themselves making clay and more so with these blots. This is brilliant. I'm a genius. Like, this is just because the magic, like, so you're giving them a big blot of a big dump of paint and, and they were just lost. It was like playing. You know, and a lot of these young folk have not had that joy of playing from an early age, that free, you know, space of just finding yourself in a process, etc. you know, with attention and with care. So, you know, that's how you judge it. You know, when they're, when they're in it, when they're inside it, and hopefully you get the works of art, you get a bit of film, they do not want it sit down and give you a statement. You know what I mean? And I say that at the start of the film, I had to speak on their behalf. I wouldn't want to do that, but they didn't want to talk to camera. The verbalization, some of these young people probably can't read and write that well, you know? So, you know, let's be adult about it. We, you know, we should be able to trust, but as Rosie pointed out, you have to develop that trust in your organization and in the funders. I think the benefits with this project, as I said, they, they were doing these art sessions every week anyway. They didn't need us to come along and tell them that they were great. But on the other hand, for them to have that spotlight on them and to have that artwork in a public place and at Wimbledon and on a, on a massive giant television screen on the hill in front of thousands of people, and that special evening when they had their friends and family, those are the things that made them realise how amazing their group are. And, and as it's all peer led, they're all there chipping in, helping each other. They're volunteering their time to help each other. And it, I think it was a, a period of reflection for them on their strengths and how important this group is to those young people, um, because they were still doing art, they were still meeting up, but it was that realisation of how important the service was to those users and to the group. Um, and we just just gave some resource to that and gave it just a little boost, but otherwise it was all them. Um... Thanks again. Um, what did the two of you learn as practitioners as a result of these both of these projects? Um, I learned again that the point you want to get to, and although it's me defining it, you'd have to ask the young people, although as I say, Sarah, the artist, and I think she said it on behalf of the young people, the game at the end, wherever the, all the, the status is on the floor, we're just playing a game of football. They used to have a thing where I was growing up, I hope it still exists in this world, where you could just go to your park and ask any group of folk playing football for a game. It was like a, an unspoken, unwritten um, law that you could go up and ask for to join in a game of football. One guy really put his studs down at my shin once in Holyrood Park because he must have thought <laughs> he didn't want that. But that is what our project should be like. And that in a way, the project has to learn. Now, I know this is easy to say, but it has to learn to be there and not just deliver its paper proposal and its evaluative outcomes and get to stay. You want an experience and you want that experience as somebody's saying in the chat, that experience is based on relinquishment of power. That's absolutely right, authority. Because if we're trying to deal with the fact that some folk have got no authority, no ownership, very little stake, very little recognition, how else are you gonna do it? Yeah, I, I would agree with that, absolutely. Um, just the ability to, 
no matter how much planning and preparing you can do, you might as well just throw that proposal paper out the window as soon as you begin, like, as Robin said, um, it's over to them. And there needs to absolutely be an element of freedom and flexibility to, to let them take it where they want it to go. Um, and I think if, as because it was just me myself planning the project, you were trying to kind of keep a hold on certain things and keep it, you know, to Wimbledon and trying to please your bosses and everything. But what was actually then going on in the sessions was completely different. And it was great to, to they really integrated us into the group and it was just, you just got to sort of sit back and, and let them show you how it should be done. So I learned a lot of lessons in, in that, yes, you do need a plan. Yes, you do need a proposal to get it all signed off, but really what's from then it's a much more fluid adventure. Thanks again. Um, would you, both of you, be able to give us any top tips on how delegates considering this kind of project um, could uh, take on board going forward? Um, yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, or, or no. Um, somebody else, I've been looking at the other chat as well. It came up right, the intensity. How can you do that intensity? Well, you have to do that intensity. I mean, I'm, I'm up for it. I'm sure um, Rosie, that's what she's saying about being part of that group. She had to speak about what she was feeling. You know what I mean? That's the key. The intensity is because you want, you know, I'll be intense as I can about getting rid of who I am to be with other people. And, and, and yet, so that's what you're trying to be intense about. Now, so you've got an organization, you've got to go back at three o'clock. You need a team around you. You've talked, you know, Rosie had that with the, the art student, I had it with the, the two folks that I've mentioned, plus Emma Easton, I have to say the manager, absolutely brilliant. You know, working with good people makes good things happen. People who trust you, that's what you're all, you get make mistakes, they make mistakes. It's the trust, it's the, the ability to go further. So the tips are to try and seek, you kind of make it happen, but you seek people you're going to get on with, you seek, a good positive environment. You try to be non-bureaucratic yourself. You try to diminish your organization's demands. You hope that, you know, the, the key thing is like we've been saying, it's autonomy. I used to work in prisons and the prisoners used to say, if you really wanted us to um, develop ourselves, you would let us run the prisons. You know what I mean? Absolutely right. You know what I mean? Full stop. Yeah. Yeah, I think for for me, it was definitely about kind of aligning this similar energies and and dare I say it, values. I know that's quite a stuffy thing to align your values of your organisation, but that really helped um, to have people who are on the same page as you. Um, so that's why I, my top tip would in the in this planning phase, um, it's those convers it's those early conversations and meetings that really kind of set the tone for the project. And I think it's important to do to have those conversations to to kind of decide where the project is going to go. Um, that's where you start to find out more about people rather than sort of rushing in saying, oh, this would be a good group to work with and you know totaling along to their session, have those prior conversations as your baseline. Robin and Rose, you've both alluded to this, but there's been a question about um, uh, that the projects sound very intense in terms of working hours. When they are running, are they your sole responsibility of assisting you to deliver the project? Never, never. <laughs> and I only work three days a week. Uh, no, no, they're never. I, I was doing that project between 10 and quarter to two, I had another group at three till four, and then I was had to go back to the office and finish off the admin. That was that was that was one day. So they were doing Mondays and Wednesdays. I had groups, whatever. So I was doing other groups at the same time. I was doing my work. I was planning other projects. Da, da, da. Big deal. That is what it's like, I'm afraid. And and to do it and to be there, as Rosie will know, being there is the best bet. Now folks say your mm -hmm. bosses say, yeah, why do you need to be there? You've paid for an artist. Because A, you want to be there and B, you want to make it good. You want to make sure that you can do everything you can to make it good. I'm not saying you have to be there every time and artists can lead them easily themselves, but there is a, re there is a sort of interest there. Um, it is always intense. Now, how do you manage that? We've said about the team. That, that's the way you manage it. 
the team that's already there, their staff, they had a psychologist there even, that guy was around. They had um, community workers who were training. Oh, we had Alex as well, we had Sarah Jane. Sarah Jane did all, I was out there at half nine in the rain, sawing with the jigsaw, those characters out of massive eight by four sheets of, that was what I was doing most of the time. Sarah Jane was working one-to-one -one with them in the nice warmth, you know, getting to know them. She was better than me at it in that respect. So we all had our jobs, you know what I mean? But it all, it all goes, it's a team, it's a team. That's the best thing about it. Yeah, absolutely. It, it is intense. Um, similar working day in that you could have 60 kids doing a Keeping Healthy workshop of you jogging around Wimbledon, <laughs> the All England Club in the morning, and then another 120 foreign language students coming into the afternoon. And then the session would be, uh, I'd get there for about half past five, and then the session would be six till eight. And then I'd maybe chat with the, the leader and the artist afterwards till half past eight. So yeah, I wouldn't get home, but I was able to move my hours around, of course. Um, and then the events where they came to Wimbledon, but I had to be on the weekend, obviously, because these young people are either working or studying, um, same with the, the evening events. So you do have to make time for it, but it is absolutely worth it. And I suppose by taking, more of a leap of faith with the younger artist that did make it more kind of heavy in management of the group because she was less experienced in that she just purely just didn't have um that under her belt because of her age and where she was in her studies so it was important for me to be at the sessions but even if she had been a professional artist I don't think I would I wouldn't have missed those sessions for the world because no matter how exhausted I would be running around with all the groups that day to come and open up at that group was great free therapy for me. <laughs> so um, yeah, it was it was brilliant, and you just have to go with it because it's worth it overall. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Just about. You coming and going. Up. Looking ahead, I think that I think that's the question. Oh, I'm about, breaking up. Yeah, is that the question about going forward? Time. Have any of you got? Yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> going forward plans plus the COVID situation. COVID situation so far, you know, difficult. It's not the same not being there. There's no question about that. I think we've got real problems in the kind of work that we've been doing over the last few years because we usually to do all these things we've been banging on about about letting go and all that well you need to be there to let go it's quite hard to let go online you know it's a lot more and they they're a lot more um they don't know each other the groups might have formed online you know what i mean the, they've not they've not met each other they've got anxieties you know they turn off their videos you know what i mean there are a lot of issues i think we're going to have to overcome i'm sure many organizations have got further down the road than we are at the moment but there you go i think it is going to be a very big challenge um, next project we're doing, we've applied, we just applied to, we've not got the funding yet, but we applied for it to do an alternative curriculum in, in a school in Selkirk, plus youth unemployment groups that we already work with in the borders. But the, the headmaster's given us this whole shed, brilliant place, windows, you know, it's good, big, big room. It's going to be a studio. It's going to, they are going to invent the subjects that they think you need to learn for life. So this, it's about creativity, it's about creative skills, but it's also about learning for life and about making it relevant. And once again, it's trying to deal with that autonomy idea. If you, if you designed the learning, what would it look like? You know, will it be art? It's all art. I think that's what we learn. I'd like to say that about the sport. You know, sport, we all love sport, but what's sport? It's just like, it's, 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 it's creating through your body. It's creating through your relationships. It, it's, you know, forming things that don't previously exist. just conscious of the time I'm happy to answer or I can pop it in the chat as well it's imaging there oh I think we've got a few minutes Rosie so go ahead okay um so I meant to say that we had planned to to work with hearts and minds beyond um the umbrella project and the interactive element of the exhibition went down really well i forgot to mention this so the artists had an amazing idea to link the umbrellas up to bicycle pumps in the exhibition so the umbrellas would be closed and then the public had to come along and and push on the bicycle pumps to inflate the umbrella so it was like an added um symbolism that everyone needs a helping hand to 
reveal their what they're feeling underneath the surface. Um, so we were hoping to kind of explore um, kind of moods and feelings and colours in, in a more simple exhibition. But obviously the museum had to close and has been closed since um, April. Um, so what we're thinking is whether we could move some of our sessions online. We're aware of digital poverty as, as well. So it's whether we can try and sort of blended approach and maybe work, we're hoping to work with Wandsworth Council to support some local artists, to fund them to run some sessions online and allow people to create some art from their home with the view to, to put maybe doing an online exhibition or possibly a physical one um, as well. So that's what we've got in the pipeline, but early days yet at the moment. Thank you. Well, thanks very much to Robin and Rosie. Um, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Rosie, did you say that the Wimbledon Lawn Tennis Museum is still closed? Yes, it, unfortunately it's still closed at the moment, but we have got plans to reopen in March. Great. And will the umbrellas still be on display? Uh, unfortunately not, I'm afraid. Sorry, <laughs> they were up for a full year, but the exhibition will be changing, so we'll be moving on. Hopefully well, I can rehome them or there'll be accessions. <laughs> <laughs> you might be coming back to us on that one. Well, your video gave us, I think, a really good sort of um, 3D um, idea, actually, of how you've um, inserted that work into the gallery setting. So thanks very much for that. And the Scottish National Portrait Gallery, where Robin and I are based, um, reopens on the 8th of November. So we, we did put a plug in for Robin's imminent exhibition, um, Image Liberation, Force from the Ruins. So that will open in April, all being well at the Portrait Gallery. So you're welcome there anytime. And please do, I think um, we would all be happy to take questions by email. So thanks very, very much, everybody, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thanks, bye-bye. Thank you.